I mean, I, it gives me an awful lot of pleasure to welcome back to the school, though he's been here all the past week lecturing to, <laughs> to, to, to an executive course, but Paolo Dorenzio, who studied in 1996-97 the MSc in Development Studies. This was a really iconic year of the MSc. There are almost all the, the members of that class have gone on to do great things. We have another, uh, where's, where's she's Deborah? at the back there. Oh, she's in, way in the back, another <laughs> alumnus from that year here, Deborah Doan. And um, you know, perhaps she'll, she'll come to the pub with us afterwards uh, and be able to talk to you. you know? uh, Paolo has had a very exciting career. Um, I was a young guy when I was <laughs> lecturing to you. Um, he's, Younger. He's, he's senior lecturer at the Brazilian School of Public uh, and Business Administration. He's a regular uh, visiting, he has a regular visiting faculty position here at the school. Uh, comes once a year, I think, Correct. to give this mm -hmm. intensive set of lectures for one week during reading week. The real reason we, reading week was established was so the school could make a lot of money with, the executive with people like him giving executive <laughs> courses. Uh, he's been consultant with the World Bank on public finance matters for his sins. Yeah. Um, he was senior research fellow at the International Budget Partnership in Washington, D.C., um, where he worked on fiscal policy, which is you know, connected with your talk yep. today. Uh, he's been visiting faculty member at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he worked in the Ministry of Finance of Papua New Guinea. I think that's where you went right after the master's. Exactly. He won the ODI First job. fellowship. Yeah. And he went off to Papua New Guinea and ran the Ministry of Finance. I remember your communication from there. Yeah. Uh, are, are students not quite prepared for this kind of thing, knew more <laughs> in the ministry than the people who were sitting there, unfortunately. Uh, he worked for the United UNDP in Mozambique. Uh, he's been a research fellow at the ODI here in London, and and he's done a lot of consultancy. Consultancy. Uh, I won't go on. There's all sorts of other things he's done. He, but Paolo, so he graduated from here, went off to Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. somehow made his way eventually back to do a PhD in Oxford, and then. Through these various things, I mentioned some of them, he found his way to working on right. civic society and tax. So maybe you could say a little bit about that trajectory, because mm -hmm. I think the students are interested in that. And then, you know, and then go on to, yeah, fantastic. Now, do you want me to operate the slides so you can? No, leave it to me. I'll just okay. wander back and okay. forth. And so we couldn't get one of these little machines to work, so I'm going to have to find a way to move around. Uh, I'll mostly be speaking because of the machine on this side, so if some of you want to move closer, maybe, yeah, but so that I also don't have to <laughs> sort of keep looking in all kinds of different directions. So thanks, thanks James. I'm very, very happy to be, to be back to in some way, although as you say, I come back very regularly to uh, teach a course every year. So before I get to the book, let me, James told you a little bit about some of the key sort of steps in my trajectory since I was here a long, very long time ago. It, it feel, I mean, it doesn't feel like a long time ago, but when you count the years, but when you count the years, it's more than 25 years. So if somebody had told me back then, Paolo, you're going to become an expert in budgets and taxes, I would have laughed in their faces clearly. Back then, we were all into participation and social capital and we, in my in small group within a course with a lot of work on decentralization. Uh, so the topics were really other ones. But then careers, as some people say, you don't really shape them, they get shaped for you to some extent. And I eventually, uh, through a number of things, became a specialist in, in uh, government budgets, budgeting processes, taxation, public spending. More recently, I'm doing quite a bit of work on public debt as well. Uh, and over the years, became actually really interested in it and find that it's, um, there's, there's a great quote from a not very well-known Austrian uh, sociologist from the late 19th century 
Rudolf Goldschied, who says, the budget is the skeleton of the state stripped of all misleading ideologies. I think that's like, it really captures, so if you really, if you want to know how a government works, what a government intends to do, what, you know, everything you want to know about policy and policy processes, there's no better place to start than the budget. It may sound very boring, there's, you know, lots of books with lots of numbers, uh, but if you have a little bit of patience to go look through them, then you'll find all kinds of very interesting insights. So I, I don't regret the fact that I became a budget specialist, but specialist, but it took me a while to sort of get used to the idea. So as, as James said, I was very lucky, very privileged as I uh, finished my MSc here to um, get, accepted, uh, get accepted for the ODI fellowship scheme, which is, exists until today, I believe, and sends sort of young, uh, mostly economists, so they, they require a little bit of economics background, but they send you off to work, please, they send you off to work with government ministries in developing countries, and I think they span certainly many different countries in Africa, quite a few countries in, uh, uh, in Asia. Uh, back then there were people going to the Caribbean, etc. It depended a little bit on needs every, every, every year. But I basically found myself, I kind of knew the name Papua New Guinea, didn't know really where it was or what the capital, the name of the capital city was. I looked it up and then I did my uh, sort of pre-assignment uh, interview and everything and I found out I was going to go work for the Ministry of Finance. It, it was two years, super intense, really getting to work with the, the sort of the core economic team within the government. You get to do stuff which you would never get to do if you're like a junior member of a government department in, uh, you know, whatever, in, in a regular country or something like that. Back then in Papua New Guinea, I found myself the second year working directly with the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance on core economic policy matters through all kinds of adventures that, you know, if you want to come and grab a drink afterwards, I can tell you more about them. There were some very interesting stories to, uh, to tell, but it was a, a, a great experience in which I got sort of first-hand um, understanding of how governments work from the inside. I was then again quite lucky to get a JPO position, junior professional officer, funded by the Italian government, which is where I'm originally from, to go and work with UNDP in Mozambique on uh, mostly sort of decentralized finance, public sector reform in general, but more specifically uh, how local government gets financed and you know, what kinds of decentralized planning and financing arrangements can be put in place to promote local economic development. That was also a very interesting experience. Mozambique was a much more pleasant place to live than Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is quite a difficult place to live for a number of reasons. Uh, working for the UN was a little bit more challenging. You know, big bureaucracy, working with other big bureaucracies, it, had, it was much more difficult for me to really get a sense of um, whatever I was doing having any, any impact whatsoever or any, making any difference. So I decided not to pursue the UN career and I decided to instead come back to London. Uh, I went to work for ODI, now as a researcher, and really diving into this whole world of budgeting in developing countries and how foreign aid affects budgeting processes and budget reforms and, and fiscal policies in developing countries. I got so excited about it that I decided to go and do a PhD about it. <laughs> so I then moved to Oxford for four years and did a PhD there on the political economy of budget reforms in developing countries. And then after that, so it was always kind of trying to keep an, a, a foot in both the, the sort of policy work and, and research and acad more academic work. But I was never fully convinced about academia. It took me, it took me quite a few years to sort of finally join a proper, a proper university, even though I always sort of taught on the side. The teaching was definitely something I always, I've always enjoyed. But when I finished my PhD, when I was faced with the, with the choice of becoming a full-time academic and retaining some involvement with, with policy work, that's, on one hand, that's, that's when I met my then-to-be wife, who's, who's Brazilian. So at some point, I knew that I wanted to move to Brazil with her. But I also met, um, uh, who then became a colleague and friend, Warren Krafchik, who is the former executive director of this small NGO, which I assume many of you will not have heard of, the International Budget Partnership, which is a, sort of a niche 
international NGO that works on issues of public finance, of fiscal policy, fiscal transparency. Its, its mission is basically promoting civil society involvement and citizen engagement with budget policies and budget processes. So we used to work with lots of civil society organizations across Latin America, Africa, Asia, who engaged with governments trying to, uh, you know, ranging from trying to convince governments to spend more on health or spend better on education or tax more fairly, and I'll get to that in a moment, which is really how we get to the project that's behind this book. Uh, we used to do a lot of work internationally on producing uh, something called the Open Budget Index, which is an index that compares countries in terms of uh, levels of fiscal transparency and accountability around budget processes. And I ended up spending more than 10 years there, moving to Brazil, so working from Brazil, um, and coordinating mostly the research side of things. That was my, you know, my job was basically, okay, we produce a lot of data, we engage with a lot of different organizations. How can we use those data to really understand better how you know, things happen at the country level? How can we learn from the experiences of different civil society organizations in terms of how they manage to make a difference in terms of influencing government policy? Uh, and this is really how we get to, how we get to this project. Uh, last year, I then eventually decided, finally, that it was time for me to join Academia full time, so I'm now um, I'm now a faculty member at, so yeah, the School of Brazilian, sorry, sorry, the Brazilian School for Public and Business Administration. I'm on the public administration side at a place called Fundação Getúlio Vargas, which is a, a quite a large, quite a well-known sort of public policy school in, uh, in Brazil. Um, so I'm, I'm now a full-time academic, but I try and keep a I, I like to joke that before I was an activist with a, with a foot in academia, that I was always teaching on the side and doing research and trying to publish stuff. Now I'm an academic with a foot in activism and policy practice. So while I teach and research, I continue doing some work for the IBP. I'm doing some consulting work for the World Bank uh, and, and, and a few other things that sort of keep me in touch with what's, what's happening on the policy side of things. Okay, so let's now get to where this project comes from and how it eventually became this book that just, uh, that just came out. I was hoping to have a physical copy to show you. Unfortunately, I was told the physical copies are not yet ready, but it's, uh, it's available, freely available as a PDF. Anybody can download it. I'll give you the details afterwards. So a few years back, this was maybe 2018, 2019, IBP historically has worked on the expenditure side of the budget, so mostly looking at spending policies and how governments spend money. Uh, these were the times a few years back when, you know, with the SDGs and everything like that, there was a lot of talk about financing for development. As part of the financing for development agenda, there's a lot of talk about domestic resource mobilization, or DRM for short, for those who are sort of, you know, love their acronyms. Uh, and as part of this domestic resource mobilization agenda, the, the talk was, okay, governments really need to find domestic resources to uh, finance their own, their own development, which is an idea that makes a lot of sense, but of course has a lot of different sides to it. Uh, and one of the important aspects that we wanted to um, look at was the equity implications of, of this agenda. So how can countries uh, generate more resources domestically without making inequality worse, without squeezing every last penny from the poorer parts of the population while leaving rich people to basically do whatever, whatever they want and not charging them any, uh, not taxing them enough, basically. And uh, so we set up something called the Tax Equity Initiative, uh, which was our first sort of IBP's first foray in taxation issues. And one of the first things we wanted to do was to go out there and sort of see what do we know, what examples are out there of civil society groups who have engaged with um, tax policy reform, who have tried to influence tax policy in their own country, what can we learn from them, what are some of the common threads that we can see across countries and so on and so forth. And so we basically started talking to as many people as we could. We found out that there weren't that many cases or, or at least successful cases of civil society campaigns around more equitable taxation. We found uh, seven or eight or nine or something like that and then 
we decided to do sort of in-depth case studies of each one of them. The interesting part about this, this project is that rather than, so we basically collaborated with local researchers and we, in each country, or let's say in most countries, there was clearly a civil society organization that was uh, sort of pushing this campaign that had generated, uh, it sort of designed and, and, uh, uh, and tried to um, influence uh, public policy through a, through a campaign. And we worked with these groups as well. So we had basically a collaboration between a local researcher and a local organization telling the story of these campaigns in the most detailed possible way. So we have seven, uh, seven case studies that we cover in, uh, in this book. And let me quickly go through them, just in alphabetical order, so, do, so that you get a sense. Most of them are from developing countries, but we also have two from more advanced countries. Yellow vests, you will all have probably heard about them. This was uh, a sort of a popular uprising in France around 2018, 2019, when the Macron government um, increased taxes on fuel. And suddenly, the sort of the silent majority that lived in rural areas and depended on using their car uh, for getting to work and, and for doing things, all of a sudden sort of joined forces and they started occupying squares, occupying roundabouts, complaining with the government. And it became a, like a very powerful movement. You can't really call it a civil society organization. This was just individuals getting together through social media and other things, coordinating themselves and getting together to basically protest. It started off as just as a series of protests. It then gradually became a little bit more coordinated and organized, and they started putting forward proposals for the reintroduction of taxation on wealth and arguing that citizens, uh, that, that there should be sort of organized ways, uh, institutionalized ways of involving citizens in key decisions around, around fiscal policy and policy more, more in general. So this was case study number one. We then have a study on Guatemala about an organization called the Central American Institute for Fiscal Studies, which works in a few different countries in Central America. And they basically, they had been doing work on tax administration for a long time. In 2015, there was a big corruption scandal that involved the tax administration and that led to the uh, resignation of both the president and the vice president who were charged with, with corruption. And Isethi was able to basically, as soon as the, the, the protests around this corruption scandal um, um, sort of hit the streets, as you can see in the picture up there, they immediately, based on their previous work, put a proposal on the table in the public domain around reforming the tax administration, the, 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 the actual body, government body that manages revenue collection and revenue administration in order to make it more transparent, more accountable, more open, let's say, to public scrutiny. Uh, and so through the legitimacy of the past work, they then, there was a change in government and uh, the new government then, they worked with um, the, the newly elected Congress basically to pass this, the legislation that was based on their mostly based on their, on their proposal. So in 2016, a new law was passed that made tax administration more transparent, more, more accountable. We then have a, work, uh, a case study from Kenya of an organization called the Tax Justice Network Africa that took the government to court uh, to basically invalidate a double taxation agreement between Kenya and Mauritius that they argued on one hand was, did not respect the correct procedure in terms of public, uh, um, public debate around the content of this, uh, of this agreement, uh, which had to be uh, in principle done according to, to the law. There had to be uh, some public debate before approving the, these agreements. But also they argued this was going to deprive the government of Kenya of very valuable resources, revenues that they needed to finance, to finance development. They were able to, you know, the courts actually gave them, uh, said that they were right, and so the, that agreement was invalidated. What then happened, unfortunately, was that the government sort of negotiated another agreement, which was not so different from the first, but they ticked all the boxes, and in the end, sort of the final policy result was not as, as encouraging, but it sort of gave them the tools to then sort of start other campaigns using strategic litigation as an important tool in, in uh, holding governments accountable. 
We then have a case from Mexico of an organization called Fundar, which is a human rights organization, that started with, um, so what many governments do when they, when they come to power uh, to sort of try and um, you know, find additional revenue that they can use to find the development is cancel the debts that actors, economic actors, individuals, companies owe to the government. So it's basically saying, okay, you owe me you know, two million pesos in, in uh, tax that you didn't pay, you know, I'll give you a big discount, uh, whatever, you give me 200,000, and that's part of the rest, basically. And they say this is a good way to, uh, on one hand, clean the books, on the other hand, uh, collect revenue that otherwise would never get collected. Uh, trouble is the evidence shows that this is not only true, that in fact, government should really go behind the taxes that people and companies owe rather than give them discounts and, uh, and amnesty. So they started looking at various tax amnesties that the government had implemented and mostly asking the government to be transparent about who the beneficiaries were. Uh, so putting in the public domain the names of the individuals and the organizations that had benefited from tax amnesties, you know, based on the fact that these were, uh, this was public money that we're talking about and so, you know, the public was entitled to know who these people were. It took them 10 years uh, using different strategies, mostly uh, taking the government support, but then you know putting pressure on them, using public opinion and other and the media to basically make their case in a stronger way. Once the government started uh, publishing this information, they realized that this was a highly ineffective and highly regressive measure that the, the individuals and companies they were benefiting really did not need the, the, the government help. This was uh, implicit subsidies they were receiving. They were famous footballers. They were you know, some of the biggest uh, Mexican companies and companies. And so they, they, they mounted a big campaign around this and eventually got the government to, sorry, I just don't realize that my microphone is falling down yet. <laughs> Let me try and put it back in place. Everybody can hear me, right, anyway? Okay. Um, so they then managed to convince the newly uh, voted government, in fact, it's the government of uh, Lopez Obrador, who is still in power nowadays, to declare and then pass a constitutional amendment that said tax amnesties are not going to be used anymore from now on. So it was a you know, pretty big victory, both in terms of uh, showing that this was something that was not, not good policy, but also then getting the government to uh, stop, stop doing it. Uh, Philippines, in the Philippines we documented, we told the story of this organi organization called Action for Economic Reforms uh, that basically worked again over you know, more than a decade on getting governments to increase so-called sin taxes, so excise taxes on the consumption of alcohol and uh, tobacco, uh, making the arguing that these were, you know, they, of course the consumption of alcohol and tobacco is very, uh, has very negative uh, impact on, on health. Uh, and so using the revenues that were generated through that tax to finance universal health coverage. Of course, the equity arguments here are, uh, are interesting because in principle, excess taxes are regressive. So those in the poorest strata of the population pay more in those taxes because uh, you know, what they pay to, to smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol is a much bigger share of, of their income. But they were basically making the argument that this was like a health measure rather than rather than uh, sort of a revenue measure. And they said, you know, the equity will come in on the spending side of things. If we, if we channel all that money into health spending, then the poor, uh, the, the poor people are the ones who are likely to benefit the most. So not only it will hopefully help change their habits, but it will also uh, guarantee that they have adequate health, health coverage. Uh, last two, in Uganda we looked at a campaign that was launched by an organization called Seatini, uh, mostly in reaction uh, to two types of, again, excise taxes. One on mobile money transfers in, in Africa, especially in rural areas. Money moves around mostly through mobile phones. You can basically transfer money from a phone to, to another, and that's, that's very used by, by a lot of people, especially in rural areas. So remittances, for example, from the big city to 
rural areas is often done using, using these uh, transfers, but also on the use of social media. This was Museveni trying to curb so-called gossip, where he said, you know, people are saying bad things about the government on social media, so we'll tax them because they shouldn't be doing that, basically. Uh, so there was, again, a big campaign around this. This was only partly successful. They managed to sort of reduce the tax on mobile money transfers by half. They didn't manage to get the government to sort of repeal the tax on social media. But it's a very interesting campaign in terms of the different strategies that this organization adopted and tried to use to get the government to change its ways. Uh, final case, the other one on, on, uh, on a more advanced kind of rich country, uh, USA. We actually looked at three initiatives in three different states, Maine, Massachusetts, and Minnesota, where different types of citizen coalitions uh, used various approaches to promote higher taxes on uh, on rich individuals, so increasing the progressiveness of personal income uh, taxation. What is interesting about these case studies, one is that there are very different types of civil society organizations that, uh, that were behind them. So you have from you know, this loose network of individuals getting together to social media in France to more think tank types to more like grassroots and social movement mobilization. Uh, to more sort of uh, externally funded you know, NGOs based in the capital. Some of them very much, uh, you know, some of them more technically oriented towards either fiscal analysis or strategic litigation. So quite a broad range of organizations on a broad range of different tax types and tax reform uh, initiatives, but also with different degrees of, of success as we've seen. I mean, we identified them because people told them, well, you know, uh, they were able to actually um, achieve some impact, but it was interesting to also see the differences in terms of those who you know, reached sort of full impact and those who only had marginal, marginal impact. So we looked at all of these in, in depth and then we started trying to look at what was happening across. What could we learn from all of them in terms of what were the common themes, the common threads, what could, they could tell us something about lessons that might be relevant for other organizations that want to get into this kind of work. Uh, you know, what are the tactics, what are the, the strategies, what are some of the things that might be useful for others. Uh, and I'll get to the, the lessons for specific actors later. But there were basically five emerging themes which I'll, uh, which I'll cover. The first one, very clearly, what was very interesting across these, these case studies was um, the use of different types of narratives to sort of make the case for the need for more equitable taxation. Uh, there were three main ones that we saw. The first one was clearly linked to uh, some concept of tax justice. So really saying, telling a story about why taxation needs to be more equitable and what it is that makes a tax system inequitable. So, um, for example, in the case of uh, Mexico, as I said, there was this, you know, uh, they transformed the name tax amnesties into, you know, calling tax amnesties fiscal privileges, which basically says, you know, there's this small group of people uh, who get these, uh, these handouts basically from government. They don't need them, they don't deserve them, but still because of their political connections and because of the political realities in the countries, they're able to get all of these tax breaks, which. Uh, which don't make any sense, which are highly regressive. So there, there was a whole story that they built around the need to um, eliminate tax amnesties based on a vision of a, fair, more, a fairer and more equitable tax system. A second narrative was around the fact that governments need sufficient resources to adequately fund basic services, which was clearly the case in, in the Philippines, as I said, where you know, the big item was, okay, we're going to tax you more, but we're going to use all of those resources to, to fund universal health coverage so that everybody will benefit, society will benefit, the poor people in particular will, uh, will benefit. A uh, similar argument were made in the US where taxing the rich more was meant to funnel resources, especially to the education sector in a number of different uh, states. And the third narrative is, is one around transparency and accountability and the fact that, you know, uh, in order to more effectively fight corruption and promote equity, citizens need to know. 
you know, where taxes are coming from, where taxes are going. Uh, there needs to be public debate around some of these things in order to really make tax systems more and more equitable. This was, again, clear in the Mexico case, uh, very clear in the Guatemala case, where the whole reform was around making tax administration more, more transparent and more accountable. Above and beyond this, what we found was that, great, a narrative is you know, being able to tell a good story about the need for more equitable taxation. But crafting a good story, in many cases, was not enough. So you, were, you, you had to be able to tell the story in a way that made it relevant and interesting to the key audiences that you're meant to reach. So a lot of work on messaging, a lot of work with the media to basically disseminate and amplify the narrative through different types of avenues and making sure that this gets to, gets to the right people and sort of builds consensus and support for the kind of reform that these organizations were supporting. <laughs> Second emerging theme was about strategies. So what we see across the cases is a, quite a broad range of uh, different ways in which organizations were trying to uh, influence government policy. So either, again, knocking on the door of the Minister of Finance, you know, bringing technical analysis, trying to sit down with, with uh, technocrats and decision makers within governments, working through Congress, parliaments, lobbying legislatures in different ways, whether in, you know, in the main party, in the opposition party, mobilizing grassroots activism, working with social movements, trying to build a critical mass of support outside of government, which could then, you know, working through the media, working through protests, demonstrations, and other public events, could build outside pressure on government to, uh, to change. Uh, and in some cases, as I said, strategic litigation, taking governments to court, building a legal case for reform, which would force government to, um, to change its, uh, its policies. So in the case of Guatemala, Guatemala for example, there was a, a very interesting combination of strategies. First working, you know, riding the wave of public protests and therefore trying to really be in there, putting their proposal on the table, uh, finding allies in other parts of civil society within business, within grassroots activism and so on. But then once the government changed and a new potentially friendlier, let's say, Congress uh, took power, then they shifted to the more technical uh, work to uh, engaging with new legislatures, trying to uh, promote political debate within Congress on the need for legislation and, and so on. And in Uganda also, we see, it's interesting to see actually, so what the evidence says, it, the, more, so the, the more successful camp campaigns are the ones that use a mix of strategies. So you, if you cannot rely on a single strategy and hope that it works, you have to be ready to sort of use all of the different entry points uh, that exist and do it in as strategic a way as possible. So in the case of Guatemala, it was very clear that they had a very clear strategy where Every time something changed, they sort of did something different to exploit the different entry points that existed. In Uganda, we see uh, Seatini try a whole range of different things, but it was more like a you know, spaghetti against the wall type of approach, where you throw a bunch of things and you see what sticks, and if something sticks, then you go after it, etc. But they tried strategic litigation, they tried working with radio stations at the local level, they tried working with the opposition in parliament. Uh, but not in a very strategic, in a very coordinated way. Anyway, so what we saw was basically no single strategy is sufficient. You have to use multiple strategies. The more successful ones use a range of strategies in what we see as a, as a mix of so-called outsider and insider strategies. So working directly with the government on the more technical things, uh, sort of burnishing your legitimacy and trying to put proposals on the table. <clears throat> that governments can consider, but at the same time, building pressure from the outside through the media, through uh, uh, building alliances, uh, sometimes through the legislature and, uh, or the courts and so on. Strategy number three is very much related to the, to the issue of strategy. It's about building effective, effective coalitions. So different strategies means that you have to work with different, with different actors. So being able to then Again, strategically identify the actors that can be most helpful to you in terms of making the case and, and improving the likelihood of uh, uh, reform becoming, becoming possible. 
uh, is quite important. So the idea is, you know, successful campaigns basically are based on coalitions that bring together allies that are powerful enough to overcome resistance from opponents. Opponents usually come in two main guises, clearly people within government who uh, either don't agree on the policy proposals or are resisting uh, some kind of revolt against a, a, a policy that's already been included. Business, because usually business, you know, sort of lobbies government directly on a number of taxation issues they have privileged avenues, privileged access to government actors, and they use them to basically further their, their interests. And fortunately, neither government nor, nor business are sort of monolithic organizations. You can find supporters within governments, you can find bits of the business sector that might be more, that might be the ones that are losing out from some of the reforms, and you can basically bring them into your coalition and therefore make your position more legitimate across a broad range of civic actors. Um, so we see this happening across a number of, of cases uh, in terms of you know, coalitions being as broad as possible. In the case of the Philippines, it was interesting because they combined a fiscal issue with a health issue. So they actually brought sort of the medical associations and some of the uh, you know, cancer, uh, victims of cancer uh, associations into the picture to sort of help them make the case. In the case of uh, some of the US states, you had very interesting broad coalitions bringing together trade unions, religious groups, uh, social movements, all kind of rallying together around some of these reforms to make, to you know, get, get the rich people to, to uh, be taxed more. Uh, last two emerging themes, issues of capacity are very important. This might seem sort of um, uh, obvious. What is interesting about this is that usually when people talk about capacity, they refer to technical capacity. And you know, you need to basically make sure that these organizations are able to analyze tax data, write uh, uh, interesting reports, uh, etc., and sort of build credibility with policymakers. But we found that there were at least two other types of capacity that were just as important and that needed to be combined with technical capacity to create the sort of the right, uh, uh, the right cocktail that, was, uh, that, was, that we could see in the more successful cases. Political capacity is one, strategic engagement with various actors within and outside government, so linked to the issue of creating alliances and exploiting uh, using different strategies in a, in, a, uh, in a coordinated way, but also communications capacity. This links back to the issue of narratives, messaging, working with the media, so being able to effectively disseminate research findings, reform proposals, crafting forceful narratives, and being able to reach your target audiences. Another kind of capacity which we see uh, being very important over the medium to long term, so the more successful campaigns are ones that actually take sometimes a decade or more. And during the decade or more, what tends to happen is that organizations are able to reflect, learn, adapt, change, uh, do whatever it takes to basically bear, make their, uh, their campaign more successful. And sometimes when an organization doesn't have all of those capacities inside, they can forge alliances to bring them in. So strategic litigation is something that many civil society organizations don't know how to do, so often they basically uh, come together with other groups that have that expertise and work together to promote uh, reform. Last emerging theme, political opportunities. What we see in many cases is that um, organizations exploited either a corruption scandal like in Guatemala or a changing government like uh, in, for example, in Guatemala itself after the corruption scandal in, in Mexico, uh, in some of the US states, etc. So, the, of course, you cannot create political opportunities. They, they happen sometimes and the key thing that we found was basically that whenever these opportunities arise, the ones that are able to make a difference are the ones that have done their homework and are basically ready to step in uh, and, and, uh, and sort of push for, for reform. Clearly, sometimes not much is happening, the context is not very favorable to reform, 
uh, so then civil society groups can actually do a lot of the background, the, the needed background work in terms of building alliances, in terms of burnishing their technical credentials, you know, continue doing uh, some, of the, um, some of the background work that can ensure that they are ready when the time comes and a political opportunity opens. Last slide to sort of try and bring it all together. So we had, we had seven cases, we had these five themes that we saw across, and then you know, we sat down, we said, okay, what kinds of messages do we have for different people? Who are the, the key actors that we want to um, uh, you know, speak to in terms of uh, things that they can learn from all of this? For civic actors and civil society organizations, it's pretty simple. I mean, the, basically the, f the five emerging themes that I mentioned for each one of them, uh, it's not necessarily that you know, other groups can try and imitate what others have done, but it just gives them a, a pretty broad menu of options in terms of um, uh, things that they can think about, uh, issues that they can consider. Uh, you know, for example, this issue of multiple strategies uh, being important in, in a coordinated way, you know, sitting down at the beginning of a campaign and really doing some background work in terms of who are the key actors here, you know, what kinds of things are they likely to be interested in, how can we speak to them in the most effective way, and then sort of, you know, using all of the uh, potentially relevant entry points uh, in, in a more coordinated way is clearly one lesson that others can, can learn. For government actors, and I'm you know, mostly speaking about reformers within government. Don't consider civil society as, 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 as a sort of a, as a distant enemy of some sort. Uh, you know, consider that they can be important partners in tax reform processes in a bunch of different ways, not only on using, uh, providing technical analysis, but also building political pressure from outside, uh, helping to coordinate reform coalitions and so on. And then finally, given that many of these organizations do receive external funding from donors and funders of different types, uh, these donors and funders tend to have project type support that has maybe two or three years length you know, and is tied to logical framework uh, type indicators and so on. Really for them to understand that this kind of work within civil society is, is a long-term endeavor that requires flexible support and therefore really trying to take that on board in terms of the kind of, of support that they, that they provide. That's pretty much it. So the book now exists, at least in its virtual form, uh, soon in, in, in a physical form as well. I'm still waiting for my, my copies to become available. If you, I think in the, I, I exactly. So in the link that was circulated, you can find the free PDF. If you really cannot help having a hard copy in your hands. Unfortunately, it is quite expensive. I do have some discount flyers that I can, that I can send you. It will still be quite expensive, but some people, some people like it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And people should feel quite comfortable in terms of you know, asking questions about Paolo's anything. life as well. <laughs> as Maybe I won't tell you asked. everything, but you can ask anything. <laughs> Before Deborah, I just want to go. Uh, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Um, yeah. Arsha. Um, you talked about uh, mostly the questions. civic actors try to influence policy, tax policy. And I was wondering how the state could reach out directly to these actors, for example, in the case of Ghana, where they yeah. try to do a lot of um, sort of like collective, with collective associations, and try to reach out to the and uh, ensure that the taxes are a bit more fair. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if you had a bit of experience with that, and how the two could find a common platform to discuss yeah. uh, equity, for example. Excellent. Equity. Do you want to just repeat his question because we're recording? Yeah, so he, what's your name, sorry? Arthur. Arthur, Arthur said, uh, he, you know, the book covers examples of, um, a, you know, civic actors trying to influence government or trying to uh, speak to government to, to push for reform. 
Do you have any examples of governments reaching out to civic actors of different sorts to sort of have a dialogue around possible reform paths? So, should we? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah? The, Good. the hands are not going up. Good. Repeat so, Deborah, I'm come to <laughs> in principle, if you had sort of institutionalized mechanisms for governments to have a dialogue with, let's say, society, uh, on what a fair tax system, what an equ equitable tax system look like, looks like, and what kinds of reforms need to happen in order, in order for that to happen, then of course you wouldn't, you know, probably, you wouldn't have any of these campaigns, right? So clearly this happens because states and governments, on one hand, are not very willing to have such a dialogue with civic actors, uh, and in many cases, to to use basically you know, language that might not be very uh, exact. They're captured by vested interests and so they're not interested in uh, implementing a very equitable tax, tax system that is, that is really equitable. They want to favor certain interests, certain actors. They have, um, you know, as I said before, business tends to have privileged access to decision makers. They will make their case, they usually get tax breaks of different kinds, etc. So it's, it's, it, this is a contentious issue, right? So this is, this is a political issue about resources, so it's, it's, it's a power struggle. So often it is not very easy in many ways for governments to organize a structured dialogue that really gets to the important issues related to equity and distribution of income and power, etc. Some governments try. Uh, in some of the work that we do, that I used to do at IBP with the, with the Open Budget Index, besides budget transparency, we have some indicators on budget participation, where basically we measure if mechanisms exist for governments to you know, bring their policy position to, uh, to a public debate, get some feedback from civil society and other groups, incorporate this feedback in, in the policy making process and so on and so forth. And what you see is governments are much better at being transparent than they are at being participatory in the sense of actually having a, a two-way significant debate about policy priorities around the generation and use of public resources. So there are examples out there. You mentioned the case of Ghana. It's interesting, last week we had a I had a similar event at, at ODI talking about the book and we had somebody from the Ghanaian Finance Ministry uh, as part of the panel and he was telling us about some of the efforts that they make but one of the expressions that he used was basically, you know, these, these are not very well structured processes, these are not, they're done on a need to do basis and often there's not enough time or nor enough, you know, good intention to make, the, to make them very meaningful. So I think there's Although you know, some interesting initiatives exist, there's a, a long way to go on one hand in terms of making these processes really about having a serious discussion around the, the, how equitable tax systems are. But two, you know, I think the underlying nature of, of the actors involved means that the, it is a power struggle, there's likely to be conflict, and therefore you know, these kinds of campaigns will always be part of let's say, the, the, the strategies that citizens have or the, the few possibilities that citizens have to make their voices heard. Okay, my interest of wanting to encourage the women to ask questions, my colleagues are always telling me I should call on a woman first. We have, so Deborah first, and then, and then we have, okay, and then we have a, a question here. And I'm there. Okay. Hi, my name is Jimena. Um, I have, I guess, two related questions regarding the Mexico's case. Yeah. I'm just wondering if the transparency strategy gave the expected results when it comes to debt payments. And then thinking of other Latin American countries that have a very strong economic elite that could also push the government against those transparency strategies, how effective is it to only rely on transparency? Okay. So, do you want to do one by one, or do you want to collect it? I think I prefer to do that if okay. that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so transparency is clearly necessary, but not sufficient, basically, to guarantee equity alongside many other things or accountability more generally. So, in this case, uh, as I said, it took Fundar 
10 years or even more than 10 years just to get the transparency side of things sorted. Why did it take them so long? Because clearly there was a lot of resistance from within the government. So the, the tax administration was using the argument of tax secrecy or fiscal secrecy, uh, basically saying we're not allowed to put in the public domain names of taxpayers because this uh, you know, breaks the law in terms of uh, protection of uh, private data and other similar things. And it took sort of, uh, it took you know, Fondar and, and, and the legal process many steps to gradually make this idea that if public resources are involved, transparency takes over. So transparency wins the argument against fiscal secrecy because what these people are getting is basically a, 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 an amount of public resources that they don't pay as, as revenue. So there was, there was, there, there was clearly, you know, it, it took quite a bit of time to make the argument. And as soon as the decision was taken to make these names public, a number of you know, members of the economic elite, mostly uh, you know, big companies, they immediately, uh, what's it called, appealed against this decision. And they basically tried to stop the proceedings, uh, the law basically from being implemented because they said, ah, you know, this goes against our interests and this might uh, uh, bring whatever problems for us, etc." And so it, 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 it's a long process where at different points you have a lot of resistance from some key actors that often are quite powerful. Uh, and it, in many ways, I mean, it, it took basically uh, a, a lot of outside pressure uh, and the, you know, a, a new populist government coming into power for civil society to really be able to have a proper impact on the government using these, these instruments. So transparency, as I said, is only part of what is needed to, to, to bring about change and often even transparency will, will hit a lot of uh, obstacles along the course of, of being achieved because of vested interests coming into play. Okay. I'm not sure I fully answered your question, but we can talk about it more if you want. Yes. Uh, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm studying here public policy and administration. And I'm Brazilian, by yeah. the way. Uh, and I found it interesting the way, okay, the strategies that civil entities or organizations to influence tax policy, but in several cases, uh, that, that you mentioned probably we had um, the interest groups on the other side of mm -hmm. the table. And I guess it also plays a role within the strategy of, of civil actors, for example, the, in the tobacco industry. And in Latin America, the tobacco industry is very well connected with, yeah. with uh, MPs, for example. Yeah. issue and would like to know more about this, yeah. this like changing strategy to different interest groups. Yeah, so the case of Philippines, for example, uh, the case study says, you know, uh, or there was some comment that was made by somebody, I can't remember, uh, at the beginning of the campaign saying, you know, these people are trying to take on the most powerful lobby in Asia, basically because tobacco companies, alcohol companies, they're usually big players with deep pockets, strong connections, uh, you know, able to influence it policy. Decades to tax that sector. Exactly, exactly. So they had actually, Action for Economic Reforms had a history of failed attempts to do exactly the same thing, which then got them to sort of try to be as strategic as possible in terms of building the alliance that they, that they needed to build. And it's a long-term game, which is not easy. I'm sure there's, you know, for the one successful case in the Philippines, there's probably 10 unsuccessful cases in other countries where, where uh, civil society did not, ha did not manage to do that. And it, and it takes a lot of, you know, long-term engagement with different, different actors, working strategically, using the media, uh, finding your allies within the government, finding your allies within Congress, and uh, gradually starting to try and shift the balance of power. It, it doesn't always work. In the case of the Philippines, it did, uh, but it, it's, it's, ve it's very difficult work. And the failures are probably much more, much more common than the, than the successes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Maria. Um, I wanted to ask whether there are also um, civic 
um, actors and civic organizations more at a like transnational level, mm -hmm. like cooperation on tax issues between countries and how that like that scenario looks like. So, so this is at the international level. Yes, very very much. So in fact. Our, the, the IBP's decision to focus at the country level was partly driven by the fact that we felt that at the international level there was already, already a lot going on. Um, so there are many, I mean, I don't know how closely you follow the in, international tax reform debate, but it's, 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 it's been very big and it's gained a lot of momentum in recent years. Very recently, uh, the whole process of negotiating international tax reform was shifted from the OECD to the UN. That was a big victory for, for also for some civil society groups that had been pushing for this for a very long time. So there's a, it's a much more structured debate because it's, it's, it's focused on a very few specific issues uh, that are, again are about making sure that the international tax system ensures that multinational corporations pay the taxes that they're supposed to pay in the places where they're supposed to pay them. And this is very difficult, but it's, it's, it should be possible through enhanced international tax cooperation. So many of the international NGOs have worked on, on this issue. Uh, a, a key actor, I think, is this group based here in, in London, which is called the Tax Justice Network. They do a lot of technical work around this. They've, you know, written stuff. They've, you know, they've connected at the OECD, at the UN. Uh, they also have uh, regional, um, what's it called, sort of uh, groupings of country-level uh, organizations. So you'll have, for example, the Kenya case was Tax Justice Network Africa. It's actually not a Kenyan organization. It's a regional, uh, uh, regional network linked to the Global Tax, uh, Tax Justice Alliance, which is the umbrella group. So they have regional networks, international uh, coordination bodies, all of them you know, doing quite a significant amount of both technical work and advocacy to sort of try and shift. And it, there's been actually a, a lot happening from you know, the American government pushing for this minimum uh, corporate income tax of 15% to other, other aspects of it. So. We, I mean, I, I'm definitely happy to sort of give you more details if you want. Yes. No. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> you go first, and then he also raises his hand. Um, I wanted to ask you about the topic of the visibility of taxation issues. Mm -hmm. That's always a challenge to get yeah. the, um, the civil sector on board. And what's the, um, especially what has been the, the role on the the Kenya case of the Tax Justice Network, I, I want to, to elaborate more on the uh, strategic litigation mm. aspect. Okay, so this is about the Kenyan case and how you... I think, more, I think a bit more generally maybe on um, strategic litigation, yeah. yeah. So talking about tax is definitely not easy, right? So, I mean, people don't, re I mean, they, people don't really worry about tax until the moment when they have to pay their tax bills, basically. Uh, so getting people to talk about tax and understand how the whole fiscal contract, if you wish, works, and the fact that, they, you know, the, the fact that they pay taxes means that they're entitled to some services in return, and that if they pay taxes, then everybody else should pay taxes, and that often rich people pay less tax than the poor people. I mean, all of these things are, are, are quite difficult to build a narrative around and to, uh, and to tell in a way that really motivates people to, to act or to do something, which is why this whole issue of narratives is so important, why this issue of building effective coalitions is important. And you know, the cases that we document really are some of the few successful ones. The civic actors across a large number of countries struggle day in, day out to make tax even like something that gets talked about in the newspapers. So they don't know really how to craft a story, they don't know what narrative to use, they, they find it difficult to sort of break through and, 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 and uh, get society to discuss some of these issues. So that's a very clear problem that many organizations face, which is why some of them decided that it was too difficult for them to basically go the, the public way so what we'll do is we'll focus on a narrow technical issue and we'll use the courts to make our case. If the law is on our side, then we can try, uh, 
we can try and basically pursue the issue through the judicial system in the hope that you know that's all based on technical arguments and uh, application you know how do you apply the law in different cases etc so the case of Kenya partly be also because of the fact that TJNA was not really a domestic civil society organization it didn't have sort of street credibility if, if you wish in the, in the Kenyan context they were seen as a a slightly separate entity that had more of a regional nature rather than a domestic nature. So they found it quite difficult to legitimate themselves in terms of bringing uh, you know, tax issues to public debate. Also, double taxation agreements are like even more uh, conceptually distant from people's reality than you know, taxing the rich or taxing alcohol and tobacco, which is something that people can relate to almost like on a, on a very concrete level. Double taxation agreements are as, uh, you know, un, so that basically it's very difficult for people to understand what they are, how they work, what kind of impact they have on them, etc. So they had a lot of trouble building a narrative around it, which is why they basically decided to, to, to pursue this campaign mostly through the courts. They didn't do much else, basically. They tried, they did, it didn't really stick. So, Which is partly why their campaign was not as successful as some of the others. Good. Um, we have several questions um, coming up. This is Stefan, and then and then uh, Deborah. I want to come back to this. <laughs> and David has a question, and I actually want a chance to pose a question. You're leaving. I gotta get. Oh, do you want to ask your question before I go and make your comment? Thanks for coming. Okay. You can't stay for the answers, so he loses his <laughs> chance. Stefan. Yeah, so uh, I'm interested in the case of the, the mobile money yeah. uh, transfers in the African continent. I forget which country it was. Uganda. Uganda, okay. Um, and I also researched this a lot, but it was like how the taxes are implemented, or the structure of how the taxes are implemented uh, really affects whether it's favorable or not. So if you tax like, uh, so I'm interested in how these uh, taxes were actually implemented. So on these corporations, whether uh, the tax is actually through the corporations or the tax is passed on to the consu to the basically the consumer, the people that use those accounts, increasing the, the <clears throat> usage, and that's what caused like the the backlash on the um, no tax on yeah. mobile money. Okay, so it's about mobile money. Uh, yeah, whether or not. Companies that are being taxed are simply taxed. passing the, the cost on. Yeah, yeah. So I'm tr I'm trying to remember the technicalities of it, but basically the mobile money tax was being levied on individual transactions. So it goes through the mobile phone, but then of course there's uh, I think it was the phone companies that basically managed the, the transaction. So they were they were getting taxed for the transaction, but they were passing on the cost to to the users. Think those costs were not uh, being passed on to the users, there would be less backlash. Like, let's say it was like more paid by like the. By why would why would a company not so, pass so the, it on to the? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's basically you know you only pay it if you use it, so it's not it's not a tax that is that the company has to pay if nobody uses the service. So it's 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 the it's a user generated tax basically. The moment in which you decide to transfer money, then there's like a certain amount that gets that Might gets be charged. Story to tax the corporate profits. That's right. That would be you know well. So they were this this was partly I think uh, the 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 bankers association was lobbying for this uh, because they were losing clients to the mobile money transfer market. Uh, there were lots of untaxed profits that these companies were making because these you know if you. If you make a call using your mobile phone, then you get charged based on uh, based on the call. But if you, you know, basically there was there was no it was it was an untaxed transaction, while the similar transaction within the banking system would get would get taxed. So there there was a lot of discourse from the government side in terms of bringing these transactions into the tax base, so uh, and, and making it uh, horizontally equitable in terms of. Same types of transactions within the banking system and outside the banking system. Ones were being taxed, and the others, the other ones weren't. But at the end of the day, the cost got passed on to the, the consumer, which then created the backlash. And it's interesting to know that um, 
uh, again, you, I mean, I would need to go back to the, the details of the case study, and I mean, of course, you, you're welcome to take a look at the, at the chapter if you want to know the details. But basically, they were able to bring into the coalition against the tax also the, um, the, 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 the traders that were selling uh, phone credits, which basically was where the money got taken from in terms of the mobile transactions. So there was an interesting, you know, a part of the business sector, which which was losing out from this, that got that started participating in the protest as well. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. Mine wasn't a question; it was a comment, follow-up comment. On, ah. um, I'm from Kenya, ah. so the idea was if you buy credit worth a hundred, then you lose fifty. That's right. Both credit. Yeah. And so if you were doing also like bank to mobile transfer. <laughs> now you're being charged extra so you're paying 50 for the transaction fee which comes out of your bank balance right. yeah. thank you thank you Deborah and so just the conditions that you gave around what they are kind no they're they're quite standard across any absolutely yeah in this country and others I guess what I want to know is what in, in some of these places, uh, you know, and other countries that are doing or kind of civic space is closing, and that that coalition building across civil society, you know, what 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 I've seen in a number of countries is, you know, especially the IMGO sector, including, well, may it take TGM, yes and no, um, back away because they're forced to, mm -hmm. or they can't operate locally anymore. So how? What are the conditions of solidarity across those coalitions that enable them to continue? Do you know what I mean? So when when tax justice campaigners, when transparency campaigners are under attack by their government, they might start with local campaigners, they might start with international advocates, it depends. But obviously something in these case studies enabled those coalitions to maintain themselves in spite of that. So civic society is under so yeah. Pressure and yeah. And yeah. How do these tax movements? Did you did you look at the conditions of the enabling environment for civil society across these case studies? Not in any. No, I would say we we didn't look at it in any significant way, at, at least comparatively. And many of these campaigns, to some extent, happened a little before the the. The, the, you know the the, the the real the real closing of the civic space. So they you know many of them happened like six, seven, eight, ten years ago, etc. I mean we want them to be recent enough so that we could document them properly, but they couldn't be too recent. Otherwise, it, you know. What we're seeing now is yeah. those types of campaigners yeah. are often at the front line. Yeah. Journalists, yeah. anyone around financial transparency tax. Yeah. They're sometimes the first to be attacked. Yeah. Usually, it's actually gender and human rights advocates, yeah. and then it's, it's your tax justice and yeah. justice. Yeah. Justice. yeah. I mean, what I know from some other cases that I that I follow, etc., more recently is that, I mean, on one hand, of course, so the 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 internationals, the international networks, etc., they. They don't feel like they can do that much, so they tend to disengage a little bit, and they say, you know, we'll we'll wait for better, better circumstances, and we'll keep doing our homework. Kind of what, were, were, was sort of our last uh, common theme, if you wish. But what you see at the country level, especially if if there's a lot of pressure from the government, is civil society really kind of trying to work together more and join forces to have at least a, a unified front when it comes to. Uh, uh, in trying to push government, then very often they're not really effective in terms of affecting change. And very often they're mostly busy defending themselves and keeping each other safe, if you wish. Exactly. But at the same time, I, I at least in, in a much more limited number of countries, what I see is groups sort of coming together to make sure that they, that they are able to help each other and defend each other to the, to the extent possible. You think they don't necessarily need the international actors to enable them? No, no, no. Def that's definitely not what I'm saying. I think, unfortunately, it, it, even though, you know, it is difficult. So we're going to have Deborah back when she finishes her book on international NGOs. Yeah, there you go. So that's coming up sometime in the future. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. So 
you present this you know, world of campaigning for tax justice and whatnot. And there is a movement among those who work on development to say, we have a great convergence. So the same issues where you're talking about the environment, of poverty, et cetera, affecting people in, in rich countries and in poor countries. And indeed, your work is looking at France and the yeah. United States alongside Uganda and Ghana and, and whatnot. So I'm wondering if there's a problem with this, mm. because there's also an order. So we were talking this morning in Geeva 400 about state building. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, like Edmund Burke said, tax is the state and the state is tax. In many of the developing countries, there's a very small tax base, tiny tax base, and particularly in the poorest countries. So there, there's a different order of business here in, in establishing a tax base. And it has to do very much with taxing elite wealth. Yeah. And in most cases, the international organizations that you sometimes work for, mm -hmm. World Bank, and want to have pushed, you know, what what is effective revenue raising, like VAT. That's right. You know, so regressive taxes yeah. that tax the population, where you see most of the companies that are operating, and a lot of the rich family networks hardly paying any tax whatsoever. So I'm wondering if there's an issue here that's really quite central yeah. and gets lost when you talk about the, of course, there are synergies between how you campaign and mobilize in the North and yeah. South and civil society, et cetera. But the order of business, the centrality of the question in a country where there is an established tax base and in many of the developing countries where there is no established tax base, Clearly, that's something that should be taken into account and made more of in this. Yeah. I mean, I fully agree with you. I think um, basically what we did with this was not necessarily a big reflection on uh, state capacity and the role of the state in development and how tax plays into that. Uh, it, was, it was a much more limited exercise in terms of scouting the terrain for you know relevant cases of interesting work that that we could find and learning lessons from it mostly to motivate others to follow similar uh let's say uh, similar issues um so clearly taxation in developing versus i mean low-income countries versus middle to high-income countries looks very different in terms of tax composition in terms of the you know how much how much revenues governments are able to collect, where do they come from, what do they use them for. The, the fiscal contract that I mentioned as such does not really exist in a number of countries, especially low income, and it's even more uh, countries that are heavily dependent on natural resources because the, the, the state doesn't need citizens to generate its own revenue. And uh, you know, if, if there's no, not, not a broad enough tax base in terms of paying personal income tax or corporate income tax, then that whole tax bargaining just doesn't happen and therefore it is much more difficult to start making the case for a different kind of, uh, of relationship between state and citizens. What these case studies tell me is that you know, even in environments where uh, the, 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 let's say the context is not particularly um, conducive to the kinds of the important and bigger debates around the role of the state in the economy and you know, how a state should tax its, its citizens and how we should use these resources to finance development. Even when those basic, basic um, elements are not in place, there are things that can be done to sort of push for more equitable taxation or push against highly regressive taxation, mobilize citizens around this issue. And in the hope that over time, this will become part of public debate, part of uh, how citizens see themselves and how they perceive the relationship between the taxes that they pay and the services that they get in return, uh, you know, creating a more collective, uh, uh, let's say, conscience around what taxation means and how it can uh, help in, you know, sort of promote development in the long term, basically. Okay, very good. Um, you know what I'm going to propose now, because I think we've exhausted the questions in mm -hmm. the room, so people may want to adjourn with us yeah. to the pub. I definitely need a drink, I've been talking way too much. Formally, <laughs> you can pr pursue the discussion with Paolo.
So let's all join in thanking you for a great day. Thank you all.